So welcome to the uh, Cambridge Climate Lecture Series for 2021. We're uh, talking about human well-being, justice, climate action, and the road to COP26. And we have a very international panel with us tonight. And uh, uh, one in particular uh, is uh, uh, at 2.30 uh, in the morning. So he's stayed up, which is very good of him. Uh, let me just say a little bit about the uh, Cambridge Climate Lecture Series. We set it up in 2017 as a tribute to the work of David Mackay, who died the, the year before. He was in Cambridge, one of the real uh, bright sparks in uh, the, the world of climate and sustainable energy and uh, generally motivating us all to do the right things as far as the climate. And I'm very glad to say that the series is still alive and well, and we're, uh, we're pleased to be remembering his name. Now, this evening, we will be um, receiving questions from you, so do put them into the, the Zoom Q&A function. Now, if you're uh, watching this on, on uh, YouTube or, or Facebook or wherever you might be watching it, you can post questions there as well, and we'll make sure they get put into the Q&A. On the, on the Zoom webinar, you can upvote questions to see uh, which, to, if you want particular ones to be, to be answered. And, and if we run out of time, we'll endeavor to, to get the questions to the speakers so they can answer either through the Q&A or uh, to you directly. Um, now, um, the session is being recorded. So uh, if you are, uh, uh, unable to get to the end, you can listen to it later or you can send the link to others. Well, I'm going to hand over now to uh, Kim van Dalen, uh, who is a PhD student in the University of Cambridge. Her, she's in the subject of uh, global public health. She did a biological sciences degree in the Netherlands. Uh, it's great to have her here in Cambridge and she is going to say a word or two about our chair, and then we'll move on to the panel. Thanks very much. Thank you. I will keep it very short. And uh, first of all, welcome to all the participants. And thank you so much for being interested in discussing human well-being, justice, and climate action in our road to COP26. Uh, and again, a special thank you to the panelists, and especially to Renzo in this case, because it is uh, four in the morning at this moment in, at his mo in his time zone. Um, but in this event, we are bringing together uh, leading international speakers to talk about their experiences uh, of the impacts on environmental change and to discuss how recognizing climate change as an issue of human well-being and justice has informed both their research as well as their advocacy for change. And we're trying to look for shared lessons of relevance for people throughout the world and consider how health and a justice-based perspective on climate action could be helpful in a way that we progress uh, towards climate action. Um, and we are chaired this, this evening by Professor Dam Sally Davis. Uh, she's a British physician and currently the Master of Trinity College in Cambridge, as well as being the Special Envoy on Antimicrobial Resistance on the UK government. Um, a lot of you may also know her as the previous Chief Medical Officer for England and the Chief Scientific Advisor of the Department of Health. Uh, so we're guided by, uh, by an amazing person um, and I want to hand it over uh, to Sally right now. Thank you so much. You're muted, Sally. Thank you. Thank you, Kim. Um, and thank you for keeping that short. And we all know why we're here for the CCLS lecture. But I hadn't re realized, as I'm relatively new to Cambridge, that they are in honor of David Mackay. And I worked beside David Mackay. He was chief scientific advisor in the Ministry for Climate. Um, and he was just fantastic. So I'm delighted to be here. We've got five speakers in this week with International Women's Week to have only one man um, is really quite something, uh, but everyone's stunning and good at what they do. We're going to start with Dr. Nicole Redvers, and I'm going to just sh it shortly introduce each of our speakers before they speak, where we've asked them to stick to five minutes and we'll go through the speakers, then we will open up to a discussion and questions because this is about sharing and learning together. 
So starting with Nicole, she's a member of the Denukui First Nation and has worked with various indigenous patients and communities around the globe, bridging the gap between indigenous traditional and modern medical systems. She's co-founder and chair of the Arctic Indigenous Wellness Foundation based in the Canadian North. She's an assistant professor at the University of North Dakota where she co-developed the first indigenous health PhD. She sits on the inaugural advisory board for the American Public Health Association's Center for Climate Change, Health and Equity. So, I mean, just the person to speak to us this evening and her scholarly work engages a bread scholarly projects attempting to bridge gaps between the indigenous and Western ways of knowing. So thank you very much, Nicole, over to you. Mm. Hello and uh, thank you for the kind introduction, Sally, as well as for the hosts of this important discourse today also to my fellow panelists for continuing this important work for our mother earth and, and all of her beings. Salutina, all my relations here present with us today watching, I thank you for being here to participate in our collective effort in a time of great need. The only way we will get through our existing crises is together as a collective global community. And I refer you to as Salutina, Salutina, all my relations in my people's language as we are all interconnected on this planet, made ever more clear by current shared experience of this current pandemic and that of course of our climate crises. I come from the land called Dene De, which is land of the people and we are Dene, Dene peoples. If we actually break down the word of my peoples, the word Dene, De means flow and Ne means land. We are literally flowing from the land as Dene. And the Dene peoples have a relationship with the land. Our very being, as noted, flows from the land and the land from its, its people. The Dene have a concept of flowing from the land that roots us in our landscape and creates the culture. And as such, the teachings about the land serve as the essence of our being. There's absolutely no separation from the land. And when there is, dysfunction is known to arise. Yet unfortunately, with the onslaught of human-caused or anthropogenic climate change, my home region in the subarctic of Canada has already surpassed the Paris Agreement target for temperature rise, with our region currently sitting at 2.7 degrees Celsius over pre-industrial time due to the amplification of temperature rise in the Arctic. Yet my people have contributed, like many indigenous peoples around the globe, the least to the current crisis that we face in regards to climate. Now this change has, has precipitated a, a dysfunction with the effects of climate change already being felt today through our region's animals, through our region's landscapes, and through our people who have had and still have a deep connection to their land that's been embedded for thousands of years. Indigenous peoples currently host and live in areas that hold 80% of the world's biodiversity, and yet they inhabit only 22% of the Earth's surface. Indigenous peoples manage or have tenor rights over at least approximately 38 million square kilometers in 87 countries or politically distinct areas on all inhabited continents. Indigenous peoples have developed knowledges over thousands of years about their natural rootedness, and they have actively maintained their vast ecosystems through reciprocal relationships. Indigenous traditional knowledge is, plural knowledge is, have in turn served, often without explicit consent or acknowledgement, entire nations for generations by providing ecosystem and provisioning knowledge and services such as food, medicine and mineral resources. The extraction of knowledge and resources through often forceful colonizing agendas has however created a disconnect between the original meaning of this knowledge and how this knowledge is used in current landscapes. And this creates a, a dangerous and precipitous situation where the realities of our existence have been stressed to the breaking point as evidenced by the many current global environmental changes that we face biodiversity loss, climate change, pollution. 
And my elders back in my home region tell me that we're, we're currently right now at this mo moment at a turning point as a, as a human species. Yes, yes, there's much hope still existing for our collective future and I truly believe this, but only if we take the right path going forward and nurture and develop renewed relationship to the land that embodies in us a sense of our interconnectedness. To get to a true state of health equity, a true state of intergenerational and interspecies equity will require an embodiment of the principles of social justice. And as my close colleague, Dr. Donald Warren states, we first need to walk through truth. So I very much look forward to the important discussion today and thank again the hosts and the moderator for opening up this space for continued dialogue and opening up space for Indigenous voices to be present within these landscapes, conversations, and important ways forward. So Masi Cho, thank you, and I look forward to, again, the, the discussion. Thank you, Nicole, and you're very welcome. So our next speaker is Dr. Talua Oni. She's a public health physician and urban epidemiologist, founder of Urban Better, honorary associate professor and lead of the research initiative for cities health and equity at the University of Cape Town, a clinical senior research associate um, here in the Global Health Research Group at the University of Cambridge MRC Epidemiology Unit. With that name, it's no surprise she was born in Lagos. She completed her medical training at the University College London. This is most impressive how you, where you've been. A master's degree in public health at Cape Town, doctorate in epidemiology from Imperial. And she's been profiled in the Lancet Science British Medical Journal She's a fellow of the African Academy of Sciences and past co-chair of the Global Young Academy and many more fantastic things. I'm so looking forward to hearing you and I welcome you to Lula Oni. Thank you. Thank you for the um, for the for the kind introduction and to um, and for the for the invitation. Um, I really look forward to uh, hearing the um, the inputs and the, the conversations from the from the um, from my fellow panelists. And uh, thank you, Nicole, for setting the scene so so honestly and so importantly. Um, so as um, as was just mentioned, I focus on uh, urban epidemiology. Um, the focus of my work has been in cities or continues to be in cities that grow rapidly. So with a primary focus on cities and countries in Africa. Um, so I want to focus on really the, um, the aspects of integrating climate action into health. But before I do, just the context of the urbanization and why I focus on this, it's because we know in a lot of the rapidly growing cities across the world, um, uh, the urbanization process is driving health inequality by pushing the boundaries of human settlements, disrupting these natural ecologies that we depend upon um, through overcrowded um, settlements that facilitate transmission of, of, of disease. Um, increasing exposure to unhealthy environments and inadequate um, infrastructure that increase vulnerability to disease and, and um, inequitable access to, to care, health and social. Across all of those, the equity dimension really important to highlight because all of those um, impacts on health and obviously don't impact everyone equally. So we have these dimensions of an inequality related to exposure, related to susceptibility, related to access to care, and indeed related to consequence of ill health or consequence of um, public health control measures, as has been very much um, evident through this pandemic. So I talk about, in the context of integrating action on, on, on climate and health, I talk about bringing the future into the present. Because the reality is that we often, firstly, um, when we think about health, there's often, a, you know, in, even public health people, we, we say, oh, well, the majority of factors that influence health lie outside of healthcare. And then we focus on healthcare, because that's what we you know, there's a, that's a, we know where that lives. Whereas in reality, there's a need to address these broader upstream, upstream factors. And the second myth to bust there is that health trickles down from good intentions. 
So in the context of cities, we feel because we health is important and, and good. And so we feel if we're doing something good, health will naturally follow and it will naturally follow equitably. And we know that to not be true. So when we think about integrated action for health, I will just highlight three things. So three approaches, so a kind of a what, how and who um, approach. So if we think about the what, there are these critical interdependencies, obviously, between climate and health hazards, but there are also these tensions between climate and health solutions. So I work in, in different cities in, in the African region, and one example I could give on that is um, a significant development underway in Lagos, for example, to address uh, a climate uh, hazard. So obviously Lagos is a low-lying city, uh, water, coastal city, and there's this, the plans for this huge um, new city essentially within Lagos to address the increasing, uh, the rising sea levels. But without considering the interdependencies of health, it's actually reduced um, access to public space that people use for physical activity, for, for meeting as social infrastructure. So whilst trying to address a climate solution, we inadvertently um, accelerate um, inequalities and health risks if we don't consider these inter interdependencies. Another aspect of the what is thinking about um, resilience, both in the context of reactive and proactive resilience. So I always say I have a bit of a love-hate relationship with the word resilience because it sometimes evokes um, a, a sense of helplessness in the sense that something's coming towards us, we just have to adapt to it. And that's really critical if we think about climate, we have to ad adapt to those anticipated impacts. But the reality of resilience is also that a lot of those shocks and stressors arise from intentional choices uh, of, with unintended consequences. So when we think about resilience, it's really critical in the what that we're also thinking about, proactive resilience in reducing the risk of these climate and health hazards that interact, essentially preventing the preventable. Right, um, and that takes that takes this long ranging, more systems approach. So the example I would give there in the context of the UK is when we think about um, uh, building back better and addressing the housing crisis. You know, about uh, almost a year ago, two things happened of relevance to health. Right, so there was a, um, a conversation around um, obesity strategies to address obesity because obesity is a significant risk um, factor for for COVID uh, severity which is fantastic. So conversations around um, um, advertising, marketing, great. On the other hand, there, was, there were interventions around um, urban development and housing that were, in order to accelerate housing, bypassing the, the strategies that actually ensure that the housing has uh, healthy levels of light, of ventilation, of all of the things that we know make healthy housing. So when we think about preventing the preventable, Yes, we're reducing the risk in terms of individual comorbidity, but we also have to think about the proactive resilience of our environments. The second approach in the how, and this really picks up on, on, on Nicole's point, um, the importance of three things, um, participatory community-based co-creation. Those, I mean, that's the one thing. <laughs> um, the second is taking an acid-based approach, and the third is equ being equity-centered. So, one of the critical things I've, I've learned in, in my research is, you know, coming in without actually, um, you know, co-creating the work, um, particularly in the context of this, of this kind of work where we're looking at uh, health and, and, and the environment people, just misses a trick. And for several reasons, but also related to the second point about being asset based, because we often go into a space and see what isn't there, and we don't see what is there and, 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 and think about how we can better support um, what is already happening and what the ways of the communities have already adapted. Um, and I can give a good example of that um, shortly. And the third is around being equity centered, just ensuring that the benefits are actually accrue to those that have that have the greatest need and the greatest vulnerability. So a really nice example of that um, participatory co-creation um, and the asset based approach was by colleagues of mine in, in at the University of Lagos working with the Lagos state government on a community resilience action plan in a particular poor area of the city where they actually worked with the communities to understand the ways that they'd adapted to some of those climate risks and health risks, particularly flooding. 
and then looked to strengthen that rather than coming in and swooping in and saying, here's what we're going to do to make you climate resilient. Because it turns out they'd actually been, from an adaptive resilience perspective, guess what, been figuring it out for a while, um, unsurprisingly. And the third point really is around the who. And my three who's of governance uh, relate to actors, agency, accountability. So that's my mnemonic of the three A's. So who is involved in terms of the actors? Um, are we involving across the sectors and, and the systems in, in, in the urban space, um, including the beneficiaries to ensure that um, interventions are not top down? Agency, this is one of the really, um, striking findings from a lot of the research that we've, we've, we've done to look at integrating health into urban environments is that the biggest barrier is a, is a misalignment of, of incentives, performance indicators and financing for health. So no one argues that health say and, and, and sustainability are important, but it's just not their mandate. <laughs> which doesn't make any sense because we now we know obviously that these things cut across um, all of all of society. And the third is around accountability and the importance of addressing that um, that disconnect in exposure and outcome because one of the biggest challenges we're faced with with climate change is you know similar to some of the NCD challenges that we face where the exposure today results in an outcome not in five to seven days of incubation but in three years because I my thought experiment on this is would we have acted in the same way with COVID pandemic with the COVID pandemic if the exposure to the SARS-CoV-2 virus today in London resulted in um, COVID illness with the same level of mortality in five years time in Lagos. It's just as important. It's, 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 it's killing and, and increasing morbidity just as much, but the disconnect in time and space is something that we really need to confront and, and adjust our accountability mechanisms accordingly. So the last thing I would say, if I may, just in thinking about um, four dimensions of the strategies that I've adopted in, in, in my research of bringing that future into the present are around youth, community, data, and governance. So those are almost, almost every project I do now, I think, well, is this youth privileged? Um, I, 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 I talk about the fact that even using the word youth, particularly in the cities I work in, is a little bit um, incorrect because in across the African continent, for example, the median age is 19. So we're not talking about a fringe group. We're talking about the average person, actually. So this is not a nice to have group. This is the average person. So how do we actually center what we do on the average person um, who, by the way, is living in the future already? Um, community based, as I mentioned, data wouldn't have time to talk about, but the importance of a lot of the, um, the challenges relate into in sectoral silos of understanding um, impact uh, of exposure and outcome and the importance of that intersectoral um, so health surveillance beyond disease. And lastly, integrated governance to avoid toxicity in decision-making. So I'll end there, but I look forward to the discussion um, after, afterwards. So do I. Thank you so much, Tallulah. So now we move to Dr. Renzo Quinto. So we have one man of five panelists in this uh, week of International Women's Day. As I said, he's Associate Professor of the Practice of Global Public Health and the inaugural director of the Planetary and Global Health Program of St. Luke's Medical Center College of Medicine in the Philippines. And it's probably about a quarter to three in the morning with him. He's looking very good on it. He's the chief planetary doctor of public health lab at a Glocal Think and Do tank. He did his doctoral dissertation at Harvard, investigating the concept of climate smart health systems in coastal municipalities in the Philippines. He was um, an Obama Foundation Asia Pacific leader. He's on the Lancet Chatham House Commission on improving population health post COVID. My gosh, again, a wonderful um, CV, but this one is unusual. In 2020, he was included in Tatler Magazine in its Generation T list of 400 leaders of tomorrow who are shaping Asia's future. Welcome Renzo, over to you. Thank you. 
Thank you so much, Professor Davis. Thank you uh, to Cambridge University. Good morning from Manila. It's almost 4 a.m. And it's hard to say no when you get an invitation to talk about saving the planet and saving ourselves. Um, and and uh, happy International Women's Day. Uh, I'm glad to be uh, outnumbered uh, in this panel, especially by my comrades, my friends in the planetary health uh, movement. Um, and I think the future of health and planetary health is female. You know, I think for the longest time, uh, you know, we men uh, have been uh, leading the world. And now we are seeing uh, all these uh, many different, uh, you know, challenges and, and problems. And, and now I'm glad that we have uh, Tolu and Nicole and others and Kim as well, who are, um, you know, coming together to uh, fix the mess. Uh, but I think we, you know, as, as your male allies can definitely be um, a, a part of, of this uh, important work. Uh, as you know, again, I, I'm from the Philippines, which I always describe as at the very heart of uh, planetary health. Uh, you know, and if you want to remember this, uh, PH is both Philippines and planetary health. And, and the Philippines is, is a country that, um, you know, is, is not, um, you know, uh, is no stranger to, for instance, natural calamities. Um, every year, uh, you know, we are frequented by around 20 typhoons, uh, which you call hurricanes uh, in, in North America. Uh, but, but then uh, in, in recent years, we've seen the severity and the intensity of these uh, extreme weather events uh, related to climate change uh, to have increased. Um, and, and we know that when these um, extreme weather events uh, do occur, uh, you know, your livelihood, your uh, infrastructure, food systems, and even health systems uh, become disrupted, uh, if not destroyed. Uh, and um, it's, it's not only that, uh, the Philippines is also facing uh, the fastest rate of sea level rise in the world, five times of the global average. Uh, and of course, you know, with all these, uh, you know, both the, um, you know, abrupt shocks and, and the slow onset effects of climate change, there are uh, associated uh, health effects. And, you know, as a physician, uh, I've been closely monitoring all these, uh, you know, diseases, the, the new ones that are emerging, but also the old ones that re are re-emerging. For instance, tropical diseases like dengue, leptospirosis, uh, that is very closely related to flooding, uh, but also uh, heat-related illnesses that, you know, for instance, farmers uh, who are oftentimes the most, uh, some of the most marginalized people, uh, you know, in our communities. They're the ones putting food on the table, but unfortunately they themselves cannot access uh, food. Uh, you know, these are just some of the health issues that are already uh, emerging, you know, in an era of a warming planet. And so, you know, when, when you're a physician and you realize, wow, the planet is burning and the patients are increasing, then you realize you need to, you know, expand your vision of health, you know, and your vision of healthcare. You cannot be anymore a doctor, you know, for the human patient, and you must now begin to treat the planet as, you know, another patient. And, you know, these, um, you know, interlinkages have become uh, reinforced as well you know, in the era of COVID-19. And, you know, I'm not sure if, if there are other places where uh, these, um, you know, uh, challenges have been faced, but, you know, last year when we were fighting COVID, and of course we still are, 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 are doing that, uh, we are also trying to, you know, overcome, you know, climate related uh, extreme weather events. Uh, and so, you know, you have health systems uh, and, and other, you know, sectors, you know, social services, that have been uh, overburdened, not just once, but twice. You know, on one hand, you're fighting an unseen virus, and on the other hand, you're tackling the initial effects of climate change. You know, for instance, in November alone, we had two super typhoons displacing tens of thousands of people. You know, and these people are confronted with a huge dilemma, whether I stay in the house and be, uh, you know, inundated and, and, you know, with your roof being blown away by the strong wind while protecting yourself from COVID or moving to the evacuation center. And yes, I'm safe from the flooding and from the strong winds, 
uh, but I'm likely to get COVID because of the violations or uh, in the you know the social distancing in cramp uh, you know evaluation center. So so these are the challenges that we're facing. You know uh, the dual crisis of of climate and COVID. And we know that COVID-19 also disrupted a lot of our, you know, health system operations and programs, you know, our progress in terms of the achievement of several important global health goals, one of which is universal health coverage, which remains an unfinished business. We're now, you know, our panel is talking also about health and human well-being, and we shouldn't forget that there is still an agenda that is yet to be achieve and that is UHC. The Philippines is a country that has universal health coverage on paper and then now you hear the national health insurance system or uh, agency of the country saying we can't proceed with UHC because we're fighting COVID and then now you also have these natural disasters. So you can see you know multiple challenges happening at the same time especially in developing countries but also I think uh, is also a growing threat in developed countries as well and so yesterday I was in another panel at the sixth global symposium on health systems research, also reflecting on these you know, challenges, but more from uh, the perspective of health systems. And, and one idea came up from the conversation, you know, climate smart, green universal health coverage. I think that's an ambitious agenda that needs to be you know, examined and explored. How can we make sure that the future health systems are universal, you know, accessible to everyone, not to just some people, uh, but also high quality. We want people to be leaving the health facilities, not sicker, but healthier, but also happier because they've received the health care that they need that is required by their health care needs. But also these healthcare systems should be climate smart, as I've just said, you know, and what, when we say climate smart, they're both adaptive to the effects of climate change. They're the last building standing when a, a typhoon or a flooding uh, you know, occurs in the locale, but also they're um, low carbon. And, and I know in the UK, for instance, there's a growing discussion about net zero healthcare systems. How can we make the National Health Service net zero? I think that's a fabulous you know, concept uh, that needs to be adapted to different places because for instance, in the Philippines, I can't also tell health facilities to be net zero when in fact, they don't have electricity to begin with, right? And so these are real challenges in real places uh, in the world. I want to wrap up my, my opening remarks by, you know, uh, emphasizing the last part of our, you know, in our title. You know, I discuss climate, I touch on health, but let's not forget equity and justice. And we need to make sure that equity and justice is at the core, you know, and that means equity and justice you know, between countries. So I gave to you the Philippine context, all the challenges on the ground, you know, the, the existing, you know, vulnerabilities of, of the country and, and the problems of the Philippines uh, are not unique. You know, you also have other uh, vulnerable countries in the Caribbean, in the Pacific Islands, in Africa, and we need to make sure that their needs are, are being met. But also even within countries, we have to acknowledge the gross inequalities that exist between the rich and the poor, the men and the women, the haves and the have-nots, those with Wi-Fi who can join us in this webinar, and those who cannot and cannot access to either COVID-related information or information about climate change and how it's going to affect their lives. And, you know, COVID-19 has, has just exposed all the long-standing fault lines uh, in our society. You know, now we're talking about vaccine apartheid, but also we need to remember there's also climate apartheid and there's also racial apartheid and all these different forms of divides that need to be addressed uh, in, you know, uh, as we proceed, as we walk towards the post-COVID future. And we have COP26 coming uh, in November. Uh, which has been postponed from last year. And we need to make sure that when we go to COP26, as a global health community, we are prepared. We are prepared with an, an ambitious, a visionary message uh, that brings together all these different agendas, okay? the agenda for climate, the agenda for uh, health systems that are robust and universal, as I already mentioned a while ago, but also the agenda for social justice, uh, and we need to make sure at the, uh, you know, uh, finally, we need to make sure that people 
uh, are at the core of our of our work. You know, we cannot you know forget. You know, especially you know we in the health sector, we can easily be distracted by the numbers. Behind the numbers are people who are struggling, but also who are brave and courageous. You know, I've been to so many places in the Philippines where the climate where the initial effects of climate change on human health are already emerging. But I am just so amazed by the courage and the perseverance of local communities who despite the neglect that they are receiving from national governments or even the international community, they're able to find the solutions uh, that, that will um, you know, uh, save them you know, from all of these uh, challenges that I mentioned. So, you know, I'm really looking forward to a very vigorous conversation later. And uh, thank you again for this opportunity. Thank you so much, Renzo. Um, I love your energy. And I think this is leading to a great discussion. So now I want to invite Michaela Loach. Michaela's going to be there for COP26. She's just up the road. She's in Edinburgh and COP26 is in Glasgow. And alongside her medical studies, because she's still a student, she's on a mission to demystify the world of activism and build movements that are inclusive, accessible and effective in the long term. She's a climate justice activist and the co-host of the Yikes podcast. And as well as that, she's got 90,000 followers on Instagram. So she's really cutting through and making a difference. She's recently been featured talking about the climate emergency on the BBC News in Elle, Vogue, The Herald and Eco Age. Over to you to Michaela. Hello everyone. Um, I'm super honored to be part of this conversation. Um, yeah, I'm still a student, so <laughs> I feel very underqualified compared to everyone else's um, multiple degrees and PhDs. Um, but I'm really honored to be here. So I'm a medical student and I'm a climate activist and organizer. Um, and I don't think that these two things should be separate from each other. And too often I think people are surprised that um, I kind of sit in these both these spaces. But whether it's um, my medical degree or whether it is the, the podcast that I co-host and communicating the climate crisis there or talking to my following on Instagram of it's now over 100,000 people who are interested about justice and connecting justice to climate. But it's all of these different things. I see all of these things as health work. Um, I think it's really sad that we have divorced these things from each other as if um, we only treat kind of the downstream symptoms of someone's um, health impacts rather than the upstream causes um, of social, whether, whether it's social inequality or the climate crisis or different things like that. Um, my work um, is basically around communication. It's how can we communicate the climate crisis to other people? How can we communicate um, issues of injustice to the wider population? And how can we show that all of these things are interconnected? And that's kind of where I focus is on the intersectionality and on the interconnectivity of all of these different issues because the climate crisis cannot be separated from issues of social injustice and issues of oppression and from white supremacy and patriarchy and cisgender and heteronormativity. These oppressive systems are inherently connected to the climate crisis because the climate crisis is the great multiplier of all of these different inequalities. And health obviously intersects with inequality in so many different ways. Um, Hilary Graham, who is a sociologist and social policy expert, talks about this as social inequality becomes written on the body as health inequalities. And that's the way that I try and think about it is that's how interconnected that social inequality is with health is that it literally becomes written on the body in the way that um, different communities that are marginalized and oppressed in certain ways experience um, unequal levels of health. I, I'll try and keep this short because I'm so excited to kind of answer questions and talk to each other about these different things. But the main thing that I want to focus on um, through all of these discussions and through all of my work is the fact that social inequality, racial justice, um, gender justice, all these different things are inherently connected to the climate crisis. And we can't look at the climate crisis or climate justice work um, as a single issue struggle, because as Audre Lorde said, we cannot have single issue struggles because we don't live single issue lives. Um, none of these issues exist in a vacuum. They all interact with each other. And therefore we can't just focus on health without focusing on these other issues. In many ways, when we take a climate justice um, approach, when we take an approach that sees that the climate crisis is inherently connected to systems of oppression and injustice, then so many co-benefits arise for health when we tackle the climate crisis through these solutions that focus justice. And I think that's such a better sell. And that's why I think we'll talk about this a bit later, but well, I think it's so great when we talk about health um, 
uh, we'll talk about the climate crisis through a health lens. We're able to talk about justice and the co-benefits that arise. And we're also able to create a better world for all people. Um, and it's less about giving stuff up, but more about creating a better future for all of us. Um, and I think that is so, so important. Um, so I think communication is so, so important with the climate crisis and with justice and with health. And I think we have a great opportunity to communicate that. So I'm, I'm keeping it really short, but I'm looking forward to answering people's questions um, later on and having a chat about that. Um, and I'm really honored to be here. So I'll pass it on now to whoever's next. Thank you very much, Michaela. Um, and you do know how to communicate. Now we know why you've got over 100,000 followers. Thank you. So we move to our last um, panel member who's speaking now, Stella Hartinger. Dr. Hartinger is the director of the Integrated Development, Health and Environment Unit at the Public Health School at Cayetano Heredia University, Lima, Peru. I could have done that better. Her current experience in research studies combines projects in community health in Andean populations, randomized control trials, follow-up of large cohorts and large series of statistical data analysis. So really any methodology that will help her get her answers because she's got three big interests, delivering health interventions, addressing environmental health problems, creating supportive environments for disease prevention and maintaining health and well-being. She's the director of the newly launched Lancet Countdown Health and Climate Change in South America. Thank you. Over to you, Stella. Hi, everybody. And thank you for inviting me to this panel. And I am really, really, really happy to be here. And I'm so impressed with everybody's presentations and what you guys have been talking about. And um, I must confess that I usually go to more academic spaces. So this is a little bit of a, of a challenge for me. So I will try to adapt to, to all the energy that I've been seeing through all the, to, from, from all the other panelists. But um, maybe I will tell you a little bit of what we do in Peru, of what I've been doing in Peru, how the Lancet uh, came to be in South America, but I think because I think that's very important um, since my focus is really on um, on research and evidence, and uh, I actually have little experience on communication, Michaela, and I think it's the key because I do think some scientists really don't know how to communicate very well. so, uh, bear with me and I'll just tell you a little bit of what I think and how do I th uh, think it's going on. So for the past 15 years, I've been working in environmental health. Um, I manage a research center in northern Peru um, where I work with rural Andean communities uh, where we, we, we had the aim of improving child health and development um, through low cost interventions uh, on, how, uh, on water, sanitation and hygiene clean cook stoves and child development so that we can actually reduce illness and foster well-being in the household in general. Um, it gives you a very unique perspective to be living in the communities for so long. Um, this is an area where I, where I live and work for almost three years permanently and then going back and forth for 15 years. So I consider it my home and you actually learn a lot. And I think many of the answers and the problems that we're seeing on how to communicate about research and climate and the problems that they are going to face um, has to do with more than just health. And it's really linked to literacy, education, and trying to get people to understand what's really happening. Um, this unique perspective allowed me to join actually the Lancet Countdown five years ago, where I was asked to contribute to one of, one of their indicators on clean household energy. Of course, this is the area that I've been working for a very long time. But when I got to the Lancet, I, I, I realized it's, it's a huge collaboration, right? Between academic institutions, intergovernment institutions in different countries, um, 120 researchers, different specialities. Um, and I was the only one from South America, the only one from Central America. So this really created uh, a unique opportunity that the Lancet actually saw and say, okay, now we actually do need some regional centers in other areas where we can actually showcase, we can actually show through evidence what's happening in these areas as well. So the Lancet Countdown now tracks this 43 
plus indicators, depending on the year of the report, where we can see the link and we can track the link between health and climate change. And we've separated these key areas in five topics, um, climate change impacts, exposures and vulnerabilities, adaptation planning and resilience for health, mitigation actions and health co-benefits, economic and finance and public and policy engagement. So really huge broad, and we don't necessarily talk, we talk between the groups when we see each other once a year, but I tell you, some of the groups don't know what we do between each group. So it's really, really interesting. So the aim is to help bring the recognition of the effects of climate change and the narrow necessary response forward. Um, but as I was mentioning, Sometimes because it's such a big global report, we lose some of the countries in the, in, in the middle of it. We don't appear next to China, India, US, we're in the biggest emitters. Um, we don't appear as being the, the, the cleanest or having este, no, or having the best mitigation strategies or even adaptation strategies. So we are lost in the middle of this report. So what we're doing now is to create and to create awareness to our region as we're preparing a sister report to the global one. But with the indicators, some of the global ones, with the indicators we think that are important, but with regional experts that can talk and understand about our issues. And in order to do this, we're creating a huge network with university so that we can actually help and identify this. Um, just, just very small, because I, I just wanted to share this with you also, it's that we already are finding with evidence that there are many climate related health shocks across South America. And I think um, the biggest ones that we've seen in the last couple of years has been devastating wildfires in the Amazons, how the countries like Brazil have been exposed to how its population has been exposed to this with in it, when its turn, it actually makes um, respiratory diseases even worse. Vulnerable populations are more exposed. The elderly are also more exposed to this. We're also seeing an increase in, in heat wave exposures over populations above 55. We're also seeing um, that we are losing working hours to heat. So it's actually targeting specific areas of of uh, our economy that it's being affected. And we are seeing specifically for Peru, we're seeing that now um, dengue fever. So one of the mosquitoes that, it's, that carries dengue fever in Peru has been expanding throughout our provinces. So from 2005, when we was only persons in certain areas, now we see in 2017 that it actually doubled the area where it can actually th thrive. So, I agree with everybody in this panel that climate change is both um, is disproportionately impacting uh, first children and the most vulnerable groups, such as our rural communities and indigenous peoples. Um, and that's why most of our focus on research that we're doing now is on vulnerabilities and how to actually include vulnerabilities into our indicators of extreme weather events heat waves and vector borne uh, diseases. So I just want to leave you with one, with one reflection that I really liked from the, tw the 2019 report is that we actually have two ways moving forward. Um, the first one is that we do exactly the same as we're doing now, which I think it's not the way forward. And the other one is really to redirect and change and stay below, below these two degrees. We need to push the world towards a phase out of coal and we need the world to reach net zero by 2050. I think those are the messages that we need to have. And this is not only because it will benefit of our health, of course it does, it will benefit, we'll have clearer air, safer cities, nutritional foods. Um, we will have an, uh, hopefully a better health system and better infrastructure. But I really like this, co this, um, this component that we're talking about now. It's really a human's right and it's a climate justice issue that we do this in the near future. And I think that the evidence that we're creating with this report, with the research from our regions will help people in power to actually see that this is also important. And hopefully people like Michaela to communicate the results better than me. So thank you. <laughs> thank you, Stella. I think you communicated very well. I don't think you should worry at all about that. And I want to tell you how inspiring you all are. 
young, inspiring on top of your subject. So we're now going to go into just over 30 minutes of the formal question and discussion session. And I'm hoping we're going to see all of you, or maybe that's my fault, and I have to put you all into gallery view so I can see you all, um, because um, we can then have this conversation. So one of my friends has sent me a question, which I think is absolutely a good one for starting. But please, people, put more questions in the question and answer box and between friends, me and Hugh Hunt, who's having his dinner at the same time, we will try and fish out the best questions. So here's one for you. The distribution of power in society seems to be at the heart of these issues. And actually, Stella, you just mentioned power. What do you think those in current positions of power should be doing about this? Which of you wants to start answering that one? You can take your, uh, come on, Michaela, you're not. Yeah, okay, sure, there. I'll go for it. <laughs> yeah, go um, on. I mean, I think there needs to be a huge redistribution of power because I think the current power systems that exist are the reason why we've ended up in a crisis today. Um, I can't remember who it was, but someone was commenting on, um, maybe it was Tali that was saying about how, um, would, you know, how would we have reacted to COVID if it had been impacting a different location or a different groups of people. I think we need to recognize that the reason that the climate, I think a, a key reason that the climate crisis has been allowed to get as bad as it's got is because it was impacting um, communities of color the most. <laughs> and um, there is a huge element of white supremacy that is inherently linked there. And the systems that exist currently that, that have distributed the power as it is at the moment um, is dependent upon these oppressive systems. And so I think there needs to be a huge redistribution of power. And that means people who have power now being like, how could I give up some of my space um, to allow space for other people to come in and to feed into different solutions? Because we already have so many climate solutions. We don't need to go towards all these ridiculous technology-based solutions. We have so many amazing solutions, especially um, if we look at indigenous communities all over the world who have so many solutions to the climate crisis that we could just kind of redistribute the power that exists um, and listen to different people's perspectives and instead kind of have that sort, sort of redistribution. That's what I would kind of kick off with, but I'm more than welcome for anyone else to feed in and also feel free to disagree with me. So Tallulah, what are we going to do about all these aged white men getting in the way so that you lot can start to make things happen? <laughs> It's interesting, right, because I, I often think about this as, as two pronged, right? So how can we increase the supply of health from place and how can we increase the demand for healthy, sustainable places? And I really, uh, a lot of what you said, Michaela, well, all of what you said, but quite a few of what you said really resonated with me because, you know, a lot of the work that I do is, is, is on the top down side of things in terms of looking at the policy and looking at the, those, those structures and trying to understand what the barriers are how to shift those. Two things have really st stuck out to me. The first is that, um, the apart from the the barriers that I mentioned, the operational barriers around the, the mechanisms for collaboration, intersectoral, etc. A fundamental structural barrier is around vision. And I think we don't sufficiently confront the fact that we don't actually all have the same vision for the for the future. So when we talk about build back better now, we're not all talking about the same thing. And I think it really is important to, to confront that. Um, one of the key things in the different cities that I've worked across um, in, in African countries, um, you know, from South Africa, Cameroon to Nigeria, et cetera, the key difference with, between places that are doing something and places where you have the barrier is whether there is vision in terms of leadership and whether that is aligned and the, the actions aligned to that vision. And, and th that, that discrepancy, that dissonance is the first thing to address because on one hand you say, yes, we want healthy cities, but actually the vision that you operationalize it is, is one of investment now at any cost to health. Um, and then the second really critical thing that's come out from, from my work, and that's what drove me to, um, to, to set up Urban Better, and I'd love to chat, Michaela, about that with you, um, was really recognizing that the power, the real power lies with the demand and actually the movement and the shifting of the norms 
I think we underestimate the powers that we have to actually shift those. Um, so waiting for power to be relinquished, I think is a fool's errand, um, but we actually have um, the, the power of, of um, informing, connecting, mobilizing as, uh, people to aspire and inspire and conspire together. That is where the power lies to, to, to actually shift that power dynamic. Good, fantastic. So let's go into some of these questions that are being upvoted. Um, one from uh, Tim Malone. Is there still a role for the Earth Charter in the lead up to COP26? Should we be promoting the charter to encourage schools, universities, workplaces, homes, communities to reevaluate our pact with the planet? Nicole, do you want to have a go at this one? Sure, it's actually a, a timely discussion because uh, there was recently at the end of 2020, a new um, um, proposed version of the Hippocratic Oath for uh, clinicians and health professionals that was published in the Lancet. Uh, Renzo was part of that group as well. And there was a number of colleagues from around the world with the, the suggestion of the importance of some type of uh, what I would call from my perspective, a ceremonial role of being able to um, state and embody an action or a vision as Tulu was saying, that by having this overarching vision of, of you know, the roadmap forward, it becomes easier sometimes to be able to embody and have a clear idea uh, of what's needed. Because to be frank, a lot of people are just unsure. You know, they're, they know that there's things that need to be done. But in some senses, this idea of collective charters and unities, there's been many popping out. I've seen three in the last year from various Indigenous groups that have come out with statements um, you know, rooted within their communities, but coming out as a collective. Uh, whether or not the Earth Charter is, is the right one or not, I don't know if I can say that you know, from an Indigenous community perspective. However, I do think there's values uh, in uniting around a, a common vision and, and cause for the future. Thank you. Does anyone else want to come in on that? Yep. Can I? Please, Renzo. Yes. Yeah. Well. Well. Um, you know. Thanks, Nicole, for uh, bringing up our planetary health pledge. Uh, and and we want more health professionals. Well, all health professionals from around the world to be reciting. You know that new Hippocratic oath for the era of climate change and planetary health. And you know, re with regards to that question, I think there's so many frameworks and declarations that have already been existing. And that is what actually I was thinking about when I was hearing, uh, listening to Tolu when she was mentioning about you know, the conflict of, of visions. I think there's also a conflict of values. And, and you know, there's so many declarations. And apart from the conflict of values, there's so much lips, uh, paying of lips, paying lip service you know, to these values. You know? For instance, there's a lot of greenwashing uh, in the corporate sector, uh, you know, governments, politicians, you know, before the election, they say they're pro-environment. After the election, they pass, you know, laws that contradict what they just promised. Uh, and so I think, you know, uh, in terms of, you know, uh, what we want to do, what we want to achieve, there, there's already some, um, you know, consensus, but I think, uh, you know, there are bottlenecks when it comes to getting things done. Um, and I think one of which is, you know, echoing what Nicole was saying, I think we in the health professions uh, uh, should really step up because, you know, in, in society, who are the most trusted uh, professionals, uh, you know, in the world? Uh, in fact, when you go to the U.S. And, and in their annual Gallup polls, it's the nurses that are always uh, number one in terms of who, uh, the most trusted professions, number two, the physicians. But we're, we've not uh, taken advantage of that privilege to really voice out, you know, these uh, much needed changes, transformations uh, in society. So, you know, echoing what Michaela was saying, you know, redistribution of power, I think we physicians can, uh, you know, have, uh, you know, do have that, that great opportunity uh, for, um, you know, uh, rebalancing, you know, the power structures uh, in our society. Thank you. Anyone want to come in on this one? Please do, Tallulah and then oh. Stella. 
Thanks. I just want to pick up on the point that um, Renza made just about action and just share some internal reflections I've had over the last year. I've been grappling with that this notion of time, right? So we're talking about complex issues that will that take time. Um, and 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 what you mentioned, Renza, about action and 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 values and promising one thing but um, not 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 actually delivering on that. Two things really. One is to bring up the, the, the points I made earlier around data and governance and why that plays into that. Um, recognizing, and this is really critical, that when we talk about impact, we can think about this as um, actions that have immediate actions, um, immediate impact that's short lived, actions that have immediate impact that are sustained, and actions that have delayed impact that are sustained. So when we're talking about understanding what the impact is on, on, on health and climate, what systems in terms of our data and our governance and our accountability and our evaluations are we set up to understand and evaluate how um, uh, the, the true impact of these things, recognizing those time frames. So if we're talking about an action that is uh, delayed and sustained impact, and then we're saying, oh, we're just going to do it before the next election. It's, well, you're going to be doing something that is actually not impactful, right? Because we know that the impact is going to be sustained. So that long-term long -term, long -term, um, measurement. And related to that is this notion of, I've been toying with this idea of how can we think about rethinking about science? So from a research perspective, so the science of exigence, what would that look like? And, and I've been thinking that around the notion of Kairos time, right? So when we talk about change taking time, it's not just a matter of not today, not tomorrow, because it can take as much time as you give it. But I like the notion of this, this Greek notion of, of Kairos time, not, not quantitative specific, but opportune time for transformative action. So how can we think about the uniquely timely and radically particular action at a particular moment? And that has three components. It has exigence, it has thinking about the audience and thinking about the constraints. And of all of those, the exigence for me, it just seems like the biggest stumbling block. So that inherent pressure to do something about the situation immediately that we know has a long-term impact. So I would love to put it back out there to say, for, for, for a science, for a science as an institution or academic research environment, what does our science look like? Do we have a system that, that is set up to support research for exigence? Or are we actually limiting to, to kind of the very lowest hanging fruit that may not address the complexities? These are some of the things I'm battling with in my mind at the moment. <laughs> good questions, very good. Stella, you were going to come in. Yeah, I just I just wanted to to mention a few th uh, two things really really short. The thing about uh, power and this shift in power that you were talking about. I think that the first thing that we need to do is that we need to acknowledge. Also, everybody needs to acknowledge that climate change is a problem and that it is real. I think that that's the biggest problem that we have now. Not everybody wants to believe on this, despite that we have the evidence that actually tell us that it is here and that the impacts are already happening. And if really the biggest countries cannot actually come to an agreement that this is happening, it's very difficult for the other countries that actually just kind of follow suit, um, do something with that much determination, just, just a, a pin there. And then definitely this, this thing about accountability and of, of everybody's actions. I think that this is not really happening. I think that we talk that it should happen, but it's not happening. Um, and, and, and it's critical. I think these two points are absolutely critical. The biggest powers, the biggest countries need to acknowledge that this is real and that it is a problem and that it's happening now. Really the science Tulula is now telling us that we are seeing impacts, that uh, an, an increase in the range of dengue will affect more people this is this is really the, there's no middle ground <laughs> here right so i think that we are in a point to that this is already there i just need so how to get people to understand it and get the people in power to acknowledge it is what we actually i think what we need right now as a first step thank you um nicole there's a question aimed specifically at you from sarah dignam 
How might indigenous approaches to ecosystems and the environment be implemented to help combat, um, sorry, combat climate change on the in, an individual level around the world? Over to you. Thank you for the question. It's, a, it's an important one. And one thing that I want to highlight that's absolutely imperative and important because uh, with the climate crisis, the biodiversity loss crisis and pollution crisis, we've seen an increasing interest within indigenous traditional knowledges, including traditional ecological knowledges from around the world. One of my concerns has been is that the knowledges are being prioritized over the people. And when we talk about Indigenous traditional knowledges, we cannot uh, separate it from the Indigenous peoples themselves. Uh, and this is really key in terms of what might be next steps. Uh, we have a long history of mistrust in communities due to a lot of complex histories around the world. Many Indigenous communities are, are very um, tentative in terms of engaging in knowledge integration. Having said that, there's been a stark change within the last even 18 months to two years and even more so with the COVID pandemic coming out with a large recognition of the importance of uh, Indigenous partnerships. However, in Indigenous communities are very clear that they want it to be on their terms, uh, that they want to ensure that uh, things are Indigenous-led, Indigenous voices are amplified. But I do believe strongly that there is absolute potential in building relationships uh, because the, uh, the knowledges are so deep and so vast in regards to that, to that relational element of being with the world, with nature. Uh, that if we do not elevate those voices, I'm afraid we're going to miss a huge part of the solution-based process going forward within this uh, issue. Thank you. And um, we've got a, a question aimed at you, Renzo, from so, an anonymous person. When there is a natural disaster, like a super typhoon or flood, do you get enough international help? And is the aid equitable and net zero? Great question, and, and thanks to, for that question. Uh, of course, you know we re, we do receive uh, international aid and assistance, and and now we're seeing, you know, in the time of COVID nineteen, everyone needs some form of assistance, and 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 you know in you know in, and and this is just a, a sneak preview of what might happen in a rapidly warming planet, uh, where you have countries that will require a lot of assistance, and so. I think the humanitarian sector itself will need to, you know, rethink the way they do things. And for instance, uh, I'm very much aware Doctors Without Borders are having, uh, you know, a lot of discussions, internal discussions on how to embed planetary health in their work. And I hope, you know, more um, humanitarian organizations, uh, bilaterals and multilaterals uh, will do the same. Uh, and I think we shouldn't wait for the next disaster to happen and come up with more reactive, you know, responses. Instead, you know, again, through a planetary health lens, you know, uh, considering, you know, the long-term impacts of climate change, we must uh, adopt a more preventative approach. How can we make sure, you know, these disasters, you know, do, do not occur so that, you know, well, there, there will be less need for uh, some form of, of external aid. Having said that, uh, the Philippines, uh, as a country that has that is constantly um, experiencing all of these uh, extreme weather events, uh, has put in place some systems internally, you know, uh, for disaster risk reduction uh, and and mitigation. And and I think that is also a capacity that that countries will need to um, you know establish and and strengthen uh, domestically again because of you know the, uh, the the dwindling resources you know from abroad and and the um, you know the political economy of, of the humanitarian sector the aid sector uh, and of course the exacerbating uh, situation of the global climate so, so those are just some of my answers to the question thanks thank you Renzo so we're going to go to the is, top race is it okay question. if I quickly just jump off on some things that were said there? please yeah. do I was coming cool. to you next anyway okay <laughs> I was just going to jump off on kind of the idea of like natural disasters and resilience and countries having to be resilient themselves and link this especially to um a UK perspective as the UK being a, a country that colonized many nations across the world and is is in the last recent years giving independence to loads of nations that will soon be submerged um and how there is a connection there between the kind of um being like oh, we'll give you independence but then it means that 
there's no kind of support being given when the climate crisis ends up impacting these nations, when the UK has a huge amount of responsibility and culpability for the cause of the climate crisis. Um, I wrote my dissertation last year in Global Health Policy um, on climate migration and displacement, um, especially focusing on Kiribati, which is an, an island that isn't, so it's not previously colonised island uh, nation, but it is a nation which is a really interesting case study about how much culpability is being put on a nation that doesn't have that much power um, in order to, and they're having to create um, adaption plans and plans to my, to move an entire nation worth of people somewhere else. And when they've tried to reach out for to help for other kind of neighboring nations, um, it's interesting how a lot of these nations with a lot of power, such as New Zealand or other nations that are kind of close to there, um, will use any kind of um, argument they can to reduce any culpability in this at all or to have any culpability at all and to give any support. And that's why we need to move away from, um, I, I just think that this idea of like, it being that we're gonna inevitably have to give humanitarian aid to um, to these nations um, isn't really the kind of the perspective we should be taking as it should be like, there is a huge amount of culpability that the West or the global North or whatever, I know there's there's problems with all those different terminologies, but there's a huge amount of culpability that needs to not be kind of put on these um, non-governmental organizations that are almost meant to be giving this aid later on. It should be obviously proactively, how do we prevent this from happening in the first place, but also how do we move towards a space of climate reparations and actually paying back to these nations that are being impacted the most? Um, sorry, I just wanted to say that there, but go ahead <laughs> on to the next question. Thank you. So um, I want to go to the top two questions that have been voted. Let's start with Jennifer Hawkins. How can we motivate preventive action, that's reducing demand, waste, patient numbers, et cetera, as an effective means for mitigation? What are the barriers to the lower cost interventions? Why haven't they gained traction? And how can we address these? So, Renzo, you might be good at this, but while everyone's thinking about it, please come in, anyone. Sure. Uh, well, because I also mentioned the, the concept of prevention in my previous yeah. response, so let, let me uh, take the first stab. Uh, uh, you know, when it comes to mitigation, and, and maybe I'll, I'll focus more my answer, uh, you know, on, on you know, the, what the role of the health sector uh, is and could be, um, you know, Recently, and, and it's still ongoing, uh, I've been involved in, in a project, in an initiative uh, by Healthcare Without Harm. It's an international NGO that focuses on, uh, you know, greening the health sector. Uh, and, and in April, this Earth Month, we will be, um, you know, releasing a report, which is uh, about uh, a roadmap to healthcare decarbonization. Um, and, and what you will uh, find out once that report is out is that there's so many things that we within the health sector alone can do to reduce our carbon footprint, our ecological footprint. I re remember I mentioned a while ago the concept of net zero. Uh, and, and that is already a huge contribution uh, of our sector to, to climate mitigation. Uh, the estimate is around 4%. I'm sure that's a, an underestimate, 4% of the emissions of the world come from our sector and perhaps that could have increased because of you know the increasing uh, demand due to covid-19 you know response uh, and so you know especially now that we are uh, beginning the rollout of, of vaccines you know i wonder how we're em embedding sustainability principles for instance in the way we dispose of our uh, the syringes that were used uh, in the operation. So, so there, these are just some of the things that we can do because, you know, the health sector cannot anymore be accomplished to the crime. You know, we can't be, we can't continue treating the patient in the emergency room while at the same time emitting our own emissions that contribute to climate change that make our patients sicker. You know, I don't think that is the way to go. And that's why, again, going back to what Nicole mentioned a while ago, you know, the planetary health pledge is the answer. You know, healthcare that is more, you know, responsible and caring, not just towards the human patient, but to the planetary patient as well. Thank you. Nicole, you want to come in? Yeah, I just wanted to highlight, uh, there was just a, a publication that a group of us uh, did it uh, called the Amy Consensus Statement for Planetary Health and Education for Sustainable Healthcare, which outlines an entire framework for medical education, including nurses, but also other health professionals, physiotherapists, and a number 
Um, and it was the culmination of a, a group of global scholars that was discussing exactly this important question and how do we actually mobilize this within medical nursing schools and other health professional schools around the globe so that we can ensure that the training is beginning uh, right in the onset of training. However, having said that, there was a motion put forward too to ensure that health providers who are already existing in practice have this knowledge. I'll highlight the Center for Sustainable Healthcare in the UK, who's been a, a large lead of this based in Oxford. There's now a Center for Sustainability popping up at the University of Toronto at Yale School of Medicine, all with a lot of uh, very practical based solutions for family practice, for physicians, for emergency docs within various uh, specialty fields on uh, actions that they can take within their practices now, both for adaptation and mitigation purposes. Thank you, Nicole. And actually the panelists have, have been given by Kim the reference um, in the chat box, but I and we'll try and send it to other people. Tallulah, you want to come in. Thanks. And just because uh, both Renzo and Nicole have outlined so clearly the role of the healthcare sector, I just want to make it known that uh, not <laughs> to ensure the other sectors are not let off the hook. Um, so, um, you know, I had a talk I, I used to give a, that end up with an Oprah moment of your health professional, your health professional, your health professional, because the reality is everyone's a health professional. Some people are healthcare professionals in addition but to think about the roles that you play in creating or deleting health. And I think that's really critical when we start thinking about the, the agency um, point of, of my, my three A's of, 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 uh, of governance, because um, the leading question about why the lower cost um, uh, interventions not necessarily prioritized. The challenge is the, the science of public health is a bit of it's a bit like the science of things that didn't happen, right? <laughs> so <laughs> you know when it's when it's good. And, 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 and I think that is also linked to, and I'm going to say something a little bit controversial here, um, but shouldn't be, our obsession with heroes, right? We want to and actually I want a world where we don't need heroes. It's that not is, our obsession, it's world. men's obsession. Come on, <laughs> get it straight. Because whenever I whenever I see it's not to celebrate, it's not not to celebrate people doing incredible work, but I just feel like, you know, to say, how about we try for a world where we don't actually need heroes? That's a lot less sexy than, oh, who is the latest hero? Well, we're, 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 we're destroying our environment and then someone does something little and we celebrate it. We actually have to take those barriers down. Um, we see it in, in the context of even the COVID um, the pandemic. The big thing is like, oh, when you have vaccine, you have something shiny. Obviously that's an incredible advance and, and really a key part of the strategy. But the core boot um, leather, shoe leather kind of public health that is not sexy, that is not tech, that, but we know works is and is low cost, um, but is not aligned with. So, so if we're aligned with achieving health and not necessarily spending money or, or, or this. So again, it's the vision and the values and the leadership that is really that it really um, makes a difference here. And I think that's important to to point out. So let's let's try for a world where we don't need heroes. <laughs> Thank you. So the, I've got a question that I've been sent on my phone. We've seen a recent groundswell in social activism, which is encouraging and also surprising to some of the old timers. We're perhaps witnessing something of a backlash as indicated by the likes of Trump and Bolsonaro. Any views on how we can best ride the waves of this political division and still make progress on environmental and social justice? Who wants to try that? I, I'd love to come in here as this is, this is my jam. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> I just think we all need to organize. Like I think everyone, anyone who's watching this, like whatever space you're in, um, organizing is, I think, how we create social change. If we look through history, um, kind of touching on why we shouldn't need heroes as well. Um, if we look throughout history, it's been movements of communities of people who've organized together, not, not exceptional individuals who've created change. Um, and there's a quote from um, Angela Davis that I always kind of go back to here from Freedom is a Constant Struggle, where she says, it's, an, it's essential to, to resist the depiction of history as the work of heroic individuals in order for people today to recognize their potential agency as a part of an ever expanding community of struggle. And I think, yes, we're seeing a lot of um, polarization happening at the moment. We see, yeah, we've seen that with Trump, we've seen that with Bolsonaro and all over the world. Um, 
but if these people are going to organize we also need to organize <laughs> and i think there's sometimes there's in the response to um this far right and this extremist organizing organizing people feel completely disempowered and they're like i don't want to do anything but actually if we're disempowered and we don't do anything then we're not going to be able to create change what we need to do is organize together and in community and organizing just looks like coming together in community and working together and sharing our skills to create change and that can be outside of these big fancy flashy institutions you can do it yourself and you can learn so much more and create so much more change um so i'm very involved in community organizing and grassroots organizing and direct action and i think that's a huge way to create change and to put pressure on um and i think communication is also a huge part of that obviously and being able to find a way of communicating these like big sciencey topics into things that the general public understand because if we want people to care about the climate crisis if we, if we want people to care about climate justice then they need to understand what it is and they need to know why it impacts them and that's what i think is really important as well is because i think generally people yeah. and the, the the normal average person doesn't see how the climate crisis impacts them and or how it's impacting them now or how it's going to impact them next year or in a few months or in they see it's something that's going to happen 100 years from now and it's not going to impact them now but the reality oh, Stella, is come in now yeah go ahead yeah <laughs> no i just want to say that i that i really like everything that you're saying and just just an anecdote yeah that maybe it can can help help the group of that when we when we're talking in the Lancet countdown, we really want to have the maximum exposure of what we're finding right and and all all the time the communications is we don't have to convince the people that are already convinced. We don't know we don't need all of this we, we know that they believe in what's happening, what we now need is really people. We need to convince the other ones, the other people and Renzo this fits really, really well, because I do think the medical doctors are the way to actually go. I think that training at the university level at the beginning of the universities needs to, to happen now. So it's the only way to actually get these people already with the concepts in. And I agree, Michaela, communication of what we, of the findings in an easy way, it's, it's the only way that this will happen. So I will def we will definitely invite you to our next this day launch. Ah, and also creating spaces where, where different type of people can actually speak. No, I, I think that if you create a space like this, where somebody is super academic, I think me, but then when we do our launches, we're also trying to invite um, young groups, people that can give their opinion that no, also we, we're trying to invite other types of groups and organizations so that they can actually also spread the word of what we're doing. So maybe we should do it both ways. We should do a little bit of both. Thank you. Can, can I just add uh, very quickly, um, you know, we've been talking about the importance of social movements and organizing, you know, and, and about young people. And I'm, I'm, it's, it's a pity that COVID-19 uh, disrupted the climate strikes, right, that, that Greta Thunberg, for instance, has, has inspired among, you know, other young people. But I think the revolution now is digital. And especially during the age of COVID, I am just so amazed by the you know, surge of activity online, you know, young people, for instance, here in the Philippines, young people creating their own, you know, Facebook groups, you know, tackling so many different issues, mental health, you know, COVID response, you know, climate crisis. And so, you know, I'm very hopeful. I'm still very optimistic because I think we now have a generation that is the most educated in the world, you know, uh, you know because, you know, the information is at their fingertips. Uh, and, and they're ready to uh, take on. They're taking down notes about what's wrong with, with the leadership at the moment. Uh, and then hopefully that they, when, when the, the time comes and they're the ones in power, they will not repeat the same mistakes again. So, fantastic. Um, we're coming to the last few minutes of this formal panel, though I know that the line's going to stay open after for those who can stay. And I've got two questions. I'm going to read them both out and then ask you each to answer one of them as your final formal comment. So one of them is the top question by David Howard in the question and answer. Is it possible to achieve justice, well-being and sustainability within the current capitalist system? You might want to answer that. Or this other question, climate injustice is closely linked to other forms of injustice, racial, gender, economic, all of which create health inequalities. But it can feel overwhelming to think we can transform all 
just uh, as opposed to just reducing our carbon footprint. So how do you address that concern when talking to people about them? So pick what you want to say and let's go round. And I'm going to go round you as you are on, on my screen, which means I'm starting with Stella, then it'll be Tallulah, Nicole, Renzo, Michaela. Stella. I think both questions are very, very difficult, I guess, to, to, to answer. So um, <laughs> I will try to go with the second one. The climate injustice is it's linked to other forms of injustices. So I do think that um, yeah, it's it's difficult. It's difficult for me to 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 answer definitely. So I I do think that the most vulnerable countries are the ones that have uh, produced less amount of emissions, and they are the ones that are actually going to pay the higher price. So yes, it's a huge way of social in, injustice, and it's not just a matter of reducing our carbon footprint. It's a matter of I think responsibilities and accountabilities depending on who is who who is more responsible. It's my opinion. Um, and how do I address this when talking to people? I think this is it is complicated because not many people want to listen to that. Um, I know we are in the vogue of let's we have to do adaptation, we have to do mitigation, we have to do this, we have to do that. This is the way to do. Every country needs to do it. But as somebody mentioned, and I don't remember who mentioned it in the panel, I think that some other countries are going to are more responsible than others. And some other countries need to support these other countries that maybe don't have the means to do this in the correct way or economically or even the technologies to actually do this. So, um, yes, I think I'm going to leave it there because then it will open a huge other more more discussions. <laughs> Thank you. Then we'll go to Tallulah. Uh, yes. So. These are really, you've, you've, you've saved the easiest ones for last, um, obviously. Uh, <laughs> I think, um, I, I do think they're related um, questions, right? Because the issues around um, the, the, the different injustices, be the climate, racial, gender, are rooted in these power imbalances, which are impacted by the, the current system that we, that, that we collectively, societally value and, and prop up. Right. Um, in terms of action and that kind of feeling that it's all a bit too much, I think it really the other thing that we're obsessed with apart from heroes is the is scalability. Like we're looking for one pill that will that we can we need to find the solution that we can scale up that will address everything. Um, and and complexity doesn't work like that. And I think there is some there's an argument for the small but many. Right. So, uh, you know, in the context of, of the grassroots and, and connecting and, and doing, you know, thinking about the spheres of influence that we have and working that way. Um, and as long as we're not the only ones doing it, we know we can and we're connected, then we, and that's, those systems interlink and are interdependent. So I think that is a really important um, thing to to emphasize. Otherwise, we just don't get out of bed. Um, the second thing is around um, the, the reality. The other thing that I think is important apart from youth when we think about bringing the future into the present is the absolute critical importance of addressing basic immediate needs, right? So it's very difficult, um, you know, the Maslow hierarchy, very fundamental needs. It's very difficult to talk about the future um, with anyone when, when they don't have access to, to clean water and sanitation and safe housing. And, and so, and this is tied into that first question around uh, a system that perpetuates uh, inequality. So we can't, we can't have it, everyone needs to be talking about and thinking about the future, but we're working within a system that is widening inequality and, and keeping people in poverty. So it's it's all part of the same exigence, I would think. And I think the last point um, I wanted to make, um, really, which picked up on on Renzo's point around um, connecting and that virtual this virtual movement. One of the things that really has come out for me in this in this last year is the importance of addressing the digital divide. Right. So 
when we think about the, the movements and the voices of different young people, at the moment, it's not everybody participating. And particularly if we go, the opportunity to actually hear from everybody, the opportunity for this COP26 to involve, as you say, or a lot more people than would not have flown to Glasgow if you have a virtual hybrid system, if they have a digital. So I think we actually have a role to play in kind of health and planetary health to push for the, to addressing that digital divide. And the last thing I would leave you with, you know, in the context of the, of the first question is continue to ask ourselves why. You know why? What it, what is our raison d'etre? What it, what is was it? What is it that we that we're trying to achieve? Because it's both the head and the heart work that need to come together to achieve our future potential. Thank you, uh, Nicole. Thank you, Sally. I'll keep it uh, short here. One of the things that uh, you know is is important for me, and when I bring and talk back to my Indigenous elders back in my home community, when things are becoming very complex and there's too many issues going on, and and I'm always amazed at how elders are able to bring back to the key issues, the fundamental issues. So when we talk about the complexity of gender, of race, of capitalism, of colonialism, of all of these aspects there, um, my elder will look at me and she said, Nicole, it's, it's all about love. And it's all about love for everything, no matter what. And then I go, well, maybe, you know, this complexity, maybe it is not so complex. Maybe there's simple things here and we need to figure out how to leverage those basic human values that we all cherish so much and go back to those fundamental roots. Maybe we're making it more complicated than it actually needs to be. Uh, so I, I sit with that often and try to remember when things do get complex, uh, coming back to those basic human values that we have uh, as a society. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole. Over to you, Renzo. So is it possible to achieve justice, well-being, and sustainability within the current capitalist system? Capitalist system? You know, I think we've tried so hard, you know, for decades, sustainability, triple bottom line, you know, greenwashing. You know, we've been negotiating for 26 years and more, you know, in, and, and that's why it's COP26, right, uh, about the climate. And still, no, the, the, the pace of action is still very slow. So, so I think the answer is, you know, we need to rethink, you know, the current economic model where we're operating. There are so many uh, uh, different proposals, the donut economy, you know, the well-being economy that I think Scotland is, is uh, you know, uh, advancing. Uh, and, and so we need to start having these discussions, you know, at the COVID-19 is, is a disruption. And in, in times of disruption, there is an opportunity for deep reflection and even reset. And, and I'm just afraid and I'm just sad that, you know, one year uh, since the beginning of the pandemic, it seems that we've not really learned our lessons. You know, we're still uh, doing business as usual. I think in the age of COVID and climate and planetary health, we need a different kind of PPE. And that's not personal protective equipment. It's a people and planet oriented economy. And so that is something that we should aspire for, for healthy people and a healthy planet. Thank you. Thank you. And last, Michaela. That was great, by the way, the PPE thing. Amazing. I'm definitely going to use that. Um, and then what you're saying, I'm going to try and touch very briefly on both questions. I think that they're so interlinked. Like, I don't think you can divorce questions around challenging our economic system from racial inequality or gender inequality. Like, these things are all completely interlinked. Um, what you're saying about the pandemic being an opportunity for change. Aaron Dusty Roy wrote an article for the Financial Times during kind of the first lockdown, um, where she described, probably actually a year ago from now, where she described the pandemic as a portal and we have the opportunity to move into this new world without holding the baggage of the old world um, or are we just going to drag on this, this baggage through this portal? Um, I think it's really sad that a year on, I, I think we've held on to too much of that baggage um, and I might be kind of grieving the maybe radical possible world that I think I thought we might be able to go into, um, but I can, I'm sure that I can be a bit too hopeful sometimes. Um, but I think that when we're talking about um, a capitalist system, we're talking about injustice or all these different things. It's all based on our values and what do we value and what and a world that we want. What does we want that world to value? Do we want that world to value um, profit for a few people over the lives of many, um, or do we want the world? That, do you want the values of the world to be that all of us um, have dignity? And I think that's just the basis, the basic thing. I think that under the current capitalist system that we exist in, um, most people, loads of people, don't have dignity because um, their lives are not seen as profitable, um, and profit is being and capital. Is 
is what is prioritized. And that's why I think if we're going to try and create a new world, if we're going to try and create a world where we actually have racial justice or gender justice or any of these things, we need to have values that also reflect that. And currently we don't have that. And that's why in my activism practice, like I am anti-racist and that's why I'm in my activism practice, I am anti-capitalist and all of these different things, because I want to challenge the kind of norms that we have in the world as it is now that has caused a lot of these problems and instead move forward into a new world. Um, and kind of touching on the second question about how it can seem overwhelming. Um, that question kind of bothers me because as a as someone who is racialized as a black woman in this country, um, there are some things that I can't, I, it's not like I take, I, these things aren't an extra add on for me to care about racial justice or gender justice. It's just my existence as a human being. Um, and I see, I've heard a lot in the climate movement um, in my experience of the climate movement is people saying, people already can't deal with the climate crisis. We can't get them to also have to think about racial justice or gender justice. But we live in a world where these inequalities already exist. It's not an add-on or an optional extra. I always say that either we are going to choose to uphold systems of oppression or disrupt them. And I think we should always choose to disrupt them. And if you ignore their existence, you'll just be upholding them with the actions that you're doing. And that's why, yes, it might seem overwhelming in the first place, but that's the reality of the world. And we have to engage with these things. And we have to be aware of them. And ignorance will just breed more oppression and more harm. Um, and I think we need to step into a better future for all of us and not just try and maintain the world as it is now. Um, and instead we could think we can just push for more and imagine more. And that's why I love writers like Aaron Dutty Roy and um, Octavio E. Butler who push us to imagine more and imagine a greater future and a better world. Thank you. So thank you all of you. Um, you've given us so much to think about and very inspiring. I think we've all agreed COVID gives us an opportunity um it's and the one year in we haven't learned the lessons so it's time for a reset funnily enough i published a book with a young colleague on that reset in the middle of november so i absolutely agree with you all and you've uh, emphasized how we need to go back to uh, grassroots and we need to communicate but i think i want to finish with nicole's elder that it is all about love thank you very much back to you well, thank you very much to all our wonderful panelists. And thank you very much, Sally, for chairing so expertly. We're very lucky to have had you joining us tonight. And I'm very privileged to have you in Cambridge as the Master of Trinity College. It's wonderful to have you here. And a special thanks to Kim von Dahlen for putting together tonight's panel, uh, an inspired uh, selection of panelists, an inspired topic, really wonderful that you've put this together for us. Now, um, we've got coming up the um, next uh, CCLS event on the 26th of March. It's a very different type of thing. It will be Holly Jean Buck from uh, Buffalo, New York, uh, and Oliver Morton from London having a, uh, uh, an interesting discussion about this topic called geoengineering, which is about how we might uh, fix the climate in some way. Then two aspects, one about getting carbon out of the atmosphere and the other perhaps about reflecting sunlight. So this is gonna be quite an interesting discussion. So do sign up for that, do register for that. And um, uh, we very much hope that we'll have more events during the year, but we'll keep you in, uh, posted about those. Best way to do that is to sign up to the CCLS mailing list. You can find out how to do that on our website. And of course, you can follow us on social media uh, using the links that are on the screen. Well, thanks again uh, for being with us tonight. And really special thanks to Renzo, who really ought to go to bed, or perhaps you've already just got up and you're gonna go and have some breakfast. Thanks again and uh, good night from Cambridge.